Do you know what really sucks? Is sitting down to edit your project and realizing that you have gaps in your coverage or shots missing? You need to have a really good, specific, and detailed shot list. Head over to filmmakersecrets.com slash shot list, S-H-O-T-L-I-S-T, to get a killer shot list template along with some training where I show you step-by-step exactly how to use it. And it just takes patience. And I've been trying to do this for just under 30 years. So it doesn't happen overnight. So just be patient and uh, keep plugging away. Filmmakers have the power to evoke emotion, inspire thought, and drive universal change in this world. Right now, a real seismic shift is happening in the film industry. This is your best chance to join a new filmmaking movement. You have been called to create an everlasting impact with your unmatched, deep desire to tell authentic stories. So how does a filmmaker thrive in an environment that is almost intentionally designed to bring you down? That is the question, and this podcast reveals the answer. What's happening, filmmakers? It's George VK. Welcome to Filmmaker Secrets Podcast, episode number 31. I am so excited to introduce my guest, Mike Gutridge. He's a very talented filmmaker. I would love for you to get to know a lot more about him as we get this interview going. But Mike, go ahead and say what's up to our filmmakers and share the one filmmaker secret that you've been keeping from us. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on. I um, the, one, <laughs> the one secret I have is patience. Um, everything takes forever. Um, nothing happens as it's planned. You got to be flexible. And I, I believe, I know this will sound maybe earthy or whatever, but I believe in divine timing. I think it'll happen when it should. And it just takes patience. And I mean, I just finished my only my second feature. And I've been trying to do this for just under 30 years. So it doesn't happen overnight. So just be patient and uh, keep plugging away. That's my That's- main secret. That's a great secret. I think a lot of times filmmakers want to jump, you know, jump the gun and go get into the sort of quote unquote sexy stuff in the filmmaking world with, you know, getting on set, using the mm-hmm. cameras, the all the filmmaking toys that you see on Instagram and you want to splurge all of your savings on it. So I commend you for uh, really kind of being vulnerable in that sense that, you know, it does take time. This is not yeah. an overnight thing. It's a process yeah. and, and patience yeah. is a very important aspect of that. And, you know, I feel sorry for young, young filmmakers, especially because everything's so instantaneous now um, with social media and stuff. And um, everything just happens right away. And um, filmmaking doesn't, you know, it it takes some, it's collaborative for one. It takes an army to make a film. And when you're doing something for no money, like I do a lot of, you know, zero budget guerrilla films, it's very hard to find somebody um, as passionate as you are about your project because everyone has their own project they're trying to get off the ground. So yeah, again, it just takes time. Just slow down, breathe and be patient. So. I love that you mentioned it being a collaborative effort. Uh, how, what are some of the tips or tricks that you can share in, in getting the rest of the crew and the cast behind your project and kind of instilling that energy that you have for your own story that you're trying to capture uh, you know, across the whole film set so that everybody's working towards that common goal. Everybody has that fire so that they're mm-hmm. really working towards, uh, you know, the the same thing that you are. Yeah, sure. You know, it's funny. I, you know, in the, in the few things that I've done, um, I, I have found that the director's personality shows through in their movie, his or her personality will show through in their film. So I try to keep it light. I try to um, have fun, especially when people are working for no money. Um, You know, you have to almost be a bridge and between, you know, the the, the maybe negative and the positive energy that you'll have on set and just try to um, keep it light and keep people happy. And I found just surround yourself with creative people. Everyone's going to have a project going on. So you'll maybe work on this person's project, you know, on a weekend or two, or maybe for a week. And then when you're ready to get your project going, that person will return a favor and come work on your project. So surround yourself with a circle of people who are really creative, really positive. You'll meet a lot of naysayers. You know, they'll read your script and be like, oh, you want fog. That's a fog machine. That's going to cost forever. Oh, you want this? (laughs) Oh, you want that? You know, I had a dog in my first film, The Bone Garden, um, which my friend Tammy Cates is in. And 
I, one of the producers that was attached and ended up, you know, um, you know, going doing something else was flummoxed by that dog. Thought we would need a trainer, and she couldn't get past the dog. When the dog was like the easiest thing, you know, we had a trainer, and the dog was there, and it was no problem. So, um, surround yourself with people who can do who can do attitude, um, because it's easy to think about as something as daunting as a feature film and just give up and walk away. If you think about it, just stay present, surround yourself with positive people, um, a circle of creative friends, usually they're friends. Um, and then that's how you'll get your project done, you know, by just knowing and thinking that you can do it and then helping out. Cause you know, there's a bunch of little, you know, the same people that worked on my film or maybe doing their own film and I'll go help them out. And then I'm, they'll say like, Hey, what are you working on now? Oh, I got this other thing, you know, maybe we can shoot that you know, coming up, you know, if you have time and, and you're just going back and forth working on each other's films. So you mentioned Tammy Cates. I love that, by the way, uh, you mentioned yeah. Tammy Cates, which is that's, that's originally how you and I got connected. So I, I'm yeah. really appreciative of her to, to pass on your name because I've been checking out some of your work. Tell me about your very first film. So like, take me way back before that. What was the spark that really got you excited into becoming a storyteller and, and kind of solidifying that idea? Like, yes, I want to be a filmmaker. What was that one moment? Well, you know, when I was a little kid, I guess, um, you know, my siblings were a lot older than me. So when they would go out like on weekends, I was on home with my mom and dad and my dad loved movies and we would watch movies. And, you know, I guess I saw John Carpenter's Halloween when I was, you know, very young, my formative years. And um, I thought, wow, I want to do this. Not put on a mask and kill babysitters, but I want to get behind the camera and do something like this. And um, so that movie is Citizen Kane to me, John Carpenter's Halloween. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I, I was a kid doing all those, the fog. And, you know, when he was in his prime with Escape from New York. And from then, from there, I went back after watching interviews with John and I discovered Alfred Hitchcock because of John and, you know, when I was very young and, um, and that's what got the spark stars like, wow, you know, Sam Raimi. Um, I, I was a kid in the eighties and, uh, when the horror films were just in their prime and they were all kinds of great stuff was coming out. Um, so that's what I wanted to do. And I thought, you know, I remember, you know, cause when I got to meet John when I lived in Hollywood and, um, John told me, and I didn't, it just didn't dawn on me when I was a kid, but John said, you know, Mike, we were treated like pornographers. He said, people would look at us, George Romero, Sam Raimi, Toby Hooper, Wes Craven, and they'd say, how can you do that? How can you make a film like that? Now, especially since Scream, horror is a big thing and there's no shame in it. But back then there was almost a shame to doing it. So it was great meeting John and discovering you know, how he worked through that and how um, he was putting out all kinds of, 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 you know, great stuff back then, even if it wasn't maybe appreciated. And that's what started it. And then I, I realized, oh, wow, you could major in film and, film, you know, I went to film school. I thought, wow, this is great. And because um, I didn't do well in college until I started taking film classes. And then suddenly I was on the dean's list. So that was pretty <laughs> neat. Yeah. So um, did that. And then, you know, went to film school. I ended up moving out to Hollywood with my um, girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. And I got a job editing news at KNBC and I worked with Tracy Savage, who was an anchor out there and a um, news reporter. And um, I was doing that on the side, trying to get my movie done. And I wrote this short film called Loretta. And um, this is way got back in the caveman days. Um, not to Tracy. Tracy's very young. But anyway, Tracy and I became friends. I asked her to be in my film. She agreed to do this short film with me without even reading the script. So I made Loretta with Tracy and um, we shot on film, if you can believe that, 16 millimeter black wow. and white film. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it seems prehistoric now when we did. So we did that. And then, um, you know, I did a few other things when I was in Hollywood. But then when my wife and I started having a family, we came back east to raise our, our children. And I wrote this film. I actually wrote a film. It's funny. I wrote a film um, for Adrian King, um, who was in... Um, the original Friday the 13th, which I'm a big champion of the original Friday because I, um, now that I'm a parent, I can really relate to, you know, a woman driven mad over the loss of her child. I thought, wow, that's a pretty believable plot. You know, some of these horror films are so off the wall. So I wrote something for Adrian, but it would have cost a lot of money. Um, so Adrian's like, you know, it'd be great if we did maybe a smaller film. And then we could raise money and, and gain um, attention and energy and momentum with this smaller film. So I thought, yeah, okay, fine, sure. So I wrote The Bone Garden, which is about this woman who has a best friend and the woman suspects her husband's cheating on her, but there's also 
college um, co-eds disappearing around town. And she wonders if her husband's guilty of murder, too. So um, it was called the Bone Garden and we were going to get this done. Well, Adrian had to back out for scheduling reasons. And um, my wife looked at me and she said, call Tracy. Tracy Savage will do it. So Tracy agreed to do it again without even reading it. Um, That's how cool she is. And then we had someone else back out um, at the very last minute. I mean, we were going to, everyone was coming to town on Friday and this person backed out on Wednesday and I was behind the eight ball. I called Tracy. I said, you know, our actress just backed it out. You know, the um, the woman playing your, your best friend, do you know anyone who could come in? I mean, at the 11th hour and help us out. And she goes, yeah, my friend Tammy Cates, she'll definitely do it. So Tammy, I think I got the script to her that Wednesday night and Tammy flew in Friday and she nailed it. I mean, she's in my film and with almost no prep, no, you know, nothing, nothing ahead of time. And my biggest regret, she was so good. My biggest regret is that I, I didn't write the part bigger because I wanted her in more of the movie. Like my biggest regret is she isn't in enough of the movie because I didn't know how good she was. I didn't know her when I was writing it. I didn't know her until about, you know, a day before I met her. Um, she's so good that I wish her part was bigger, but she came in and nailed it, Tammy Cates. And I have Tracy to thank for that. Wow. Well, talk Ooh. about roadblocks and just unapologetic, unapologetically driving straight through them. That's amazing. When you have two actors back out, including your lead, um, I mm-hmm. commend you for just kind of barreling forward and, and making it happen no matter what. That That's what we do as filmmakers, right? Oh, absolutely. You've got to be flexible and you just can't be phased by anything because um, you're going to have stuff. Oh, I always tell people, it's like putting out fires. My son asked me once, he's like, daddy, what's, what's the worst thing or what's the hardest thing when you're making a movie? I said, the hardest thing is driving up to the set because I know when I get out of the car, I'm going to be met with fires to put out. Oh, we can't shoot this because of that. Oh, we can't go in there because of this. Oh, this person just, you know, there's something that's going to happen. You got to roll with it. One of my favorite movies of all time is Ed Wood. Okay. So mm-hmm. there's a scene where Johnny Depp says to the great Martin Landau, who plays Bella Lugosi, you know, you're going to be standing over here. And Landau says, I'm not going near that thing. One of them burned me on the set of another movie. And Depp goes, without missing the beat, okay, then you'll be standing over here. And that's how you got to be. You got to say, okay, we're going to do this. Oh, really? Okay. Well, then we're going to do that. And without missing a beat, because you could sit there and pine and cry about it. Or you can say, look, this happens. We got to move on. You know, and um, I got to meet um, Jeffrey Lewis when I lived in Hollywood. And Jeffrey Lewis was in a bunch of Clint Eastwood films. And he told me, Clint, you know, Eastwood is a pro at like working through obstacles where like, um, one time, Jeffrey told me this story about how during Bronco Billy, the car, there's a car that's supposed to break down and pull into a, a station, and it's supposed to be smoking from the engine, and it pulls into a gas station and breaks down. Well, they couldn't get it to smoke right. And they tried, and they tried, and finally Eastwood was like, you know what, forget it. It's not a film about a smoking car. Just have it pull into the gas station. And I say that on the set constantly. People look at me like I'm crazy. Out of the blue, I'll be like, forget it. It's not a movie about a smoking car. I'm like, what are you talking, you know, I, I just use that because it's like, you'll focus on everything will be right. And you'll focus on the one thing that's not. And usually nine and a half out of 10 times, it's trivial. It has nothing to do with the story. Oh, this window won't close all the way or uh, that doors, you know, I say, Hey, it's not a movie about a smoking car. Move on. And that's, you know, a, that, that's a great yeah. lexicon. I mean, it's, it's almost become like an inside joke that, that has uh, <laughs> sort of an outward external effect on, on your other sets. And I think that really goes really well with this uh, aspect that I I believe every filmmaker in some sense is a perfectionist and the challenge Mm -hmm. is getting over that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not worrying so much about the details. It's like, just create the thing, make it. Make the thing. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, One of my favorites is Ed Burns and Ed Burns makes really low budget films. And he has this thing. I think he says something I'm paraphrasing, but he says continuity is for wimps. He's like, don't worry. (laughs) If, if someone's paying attention to what color your that. socks are and their socks change from the living room scene to the dining room scene, then he says the filmmaker's not doing their job. You know what right. I mean? No one cares what color your tie is or whatever. So that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> that's great. I love that. So you have a, a film that's premiering July 2nd called Shadows that you wrote and directed, correct? July 22nd. Yes, sir. Amazing. Congratulations on that, especially in the midst of everything that's going on. Uh, congratulations. That's, that's, that's really great. I'm happy for you. Uh, I would you. love for you to take me back to the inception of this project. Talk to me about your, because you are a storyteller, a writer and a director, 
I, I'd, I just love to get an insight on, uh, especially the screenwriter aspect of, you know, the storytelling aspect. What's your process? Do you start with a log line? Do you do an outline? Do you just start writing and then rewrite and rewrite? How do you do it? Well, it's funny. You never know where inspiration is going to come from. And ironically, um, this new film is an art house drama. Um, it's not like a scary movie or a thriller or anything. And um, I was watching, I was, um, I lost my job. So I was unemployed and I'm just, you know, watching movies like I do. And I'm watching the original Friday the 13th, probably for the umpteenth time. You know? mm-hmm. And there's a scene where Adrian King's kind of bouncing around the kitchen, putting pots and pans away. Um, it's real quick. It's five seconds tops. And I thought, huh, what if she was packing up a summer camp that maybe her dad ran? And maybe he passed away and uh, maybe her siblings have to come help her clean it out. And all this tension arises when all these memories come back. And all of a sudden I turned off Friday the 13th and I was thinking about this new movie. I said, we could shoot it at a summer camp. It'll be one location. That'll be easy and and really cheap. Um, So it's funny how that out of this real scary movie came this kind of art house drama film. And two of my major influences, one is, I don't know if you're familiar with Lynn Shelton. Um, Lynn passed away about a year ago, May of 2020, and she did a movie called Hump Day, which, you know, got in the Sundance and changed her life. She did Your Sister's Sister. Um, Touchy Feely is my favorite. Um, Okay. She uh, was a Seattle-based filmmaker, and I never got to meet her, but I friended her on Facebook, and Lynn was unbelievable. I would send her Facebook messages. She would always reply, sometimes right away, always within a couple days, And I started watching her films, these character driven pieces on a really low budget. And I thought, man, I can do that. Um, Sometimes when you watch a film like Vertigo or, you know, Yojimbo, if you watch Kurosawa or some, you know, legend, it's intimidating. Like if I watch Vertigo or or any Hitchcock film, I'm like, I can't do that. That's really the way. But um, Lynn Shelton's films are very accessible. And I thought, oh, I could do this. I could definitely, you know, put this low budget crew together. So another huge influence on my new film is Lynn's film, Your Sister's Sister. And um, it's about three people in a remote place in a cabin. And so is my, my new film is about three people in this summer camp. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, if Lynn, and I, I was, I'd reach out to Lynn and I'd be like, you know, I'd have to shoot it on weekends and, you know, I wouldn't have any name actors in it, you know, cause my first, the bone garden at least had Friday the 13th alumni in it and people like that. Um, She's like, Mike, I shot my first films on weekends and there's no stars in them. What are you, crazy? Get out there and shoot your movie. Um, so that was a huge influence. And then Mike Binder, who I love, um, I think he's Hollywood's secret weapon. He has a film called Indian Summer, which I highly recommend. The late, great Bill Paxton's in that movie, Alan Arkin. Um, and that, that's about a bunch of people who returned to a summer camp that they used to go to when they were kids. So those three influences, mainly Lynn and Mike Binder, and then a little snippet in Friday the 13th kind of sparked this whole movie about three siblings who need to go return to their father's summer camp after he died and clean it out. And memories come up, some good, some not so good. Tension arises, there's arguments, like there always is with any siblings. And that's where it started. And um, whenever I write a movie, um, whenever I, I always brainstorm in my head, I never, never write it down, I probably should. I always brainstorm in my head for about a week or two and then when I'm about to write, I watch two films. I'll watch, or sometimes three. I watch uh, The Big Lebowski, the Coen brothers, two of the best writers around. I watch David Mamet's State in Maine. I love David Mamet's writing style, and I love State in Maine, if you haven't seen that. And I'll watch an Alexander Payne film, who's a huge okay. influence, especially the way he ends his films. Um, usually about Schmidt, but any Alexander Payne film will do. Um, and then I'll start writing. And... You know, I, I, I don't force it. I let it come. If it starts to feel forced, if nothing happens naturally, I walk away from the laptop. I don't, you know, if, I, if it doesn't come naturally, then don't do it. Um, and usually, I'm, you know, if I, I'll do it, it'll take about 10 days, maybe two weeks. And then um, I'll let my wife read it. We'll usually get in a huge argument because she'll suggest changes and she's always right. <laughs> um, so then I'll read That's a really annoying thing about her. <laughs> so then I'll do a little quick rewrite. But I don't believe in rewriting too much. I do think you can write the magic right out of a script. If uh, I've had so many people, like if you listen to the State in Maine commentary, David Mamet's State in Maine, William H. Macy says so many times people rewrite because they feel they have to. Mm-hmm. And he says, you'll rewrite and re- rewrite. And he says, Nine out of 10 times, you haven't made the movie better. You've made it different. 
And he said, sometimes, most of the times, you've made it worse. So don't overthink it and don't rewrite because you feel you have to. It is a huge part of the writing process, but don't be married to rewriting and rewriting because, you know, you think you have to. If it feels right and you're going to be the one directing it, then it feels right, then leave it. That's my motto. That's such a great sentiment. And it's Mm -hmm. actually sparked some ideas inside of my own head too for for, Mm -hmm. for my own process of going forward. So thank you for that, Mike. That's awesome. I just want to take a quick second to read the log line off of IMDb for shadows, because I think this is just a great example of keeping it simple, keeping it Uh straight, no, no fluff. Three siblings are tasked with cleaning out their late father's summer camp, but tensions soon arise while sifting through the past. There's enough tr- intrigue in that there's enough information as well that's given to, to let you know exactly what you're about to watch. But it's intriguing enough for me to want to actually go and watch it. How do you go yeah. about with that process of writing logline? Is it the first thing you do? Is it after you've written your script? It's after. And to be honest, I'm glad you like that. But um, I, I dread it. I dread it. It's my, it's my least favorite part of the process yeah. is um, cutting a trailer, trying to come up with you know, basically it's marketing. And that's the part I hate the most. And it's such a vital part. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, I, I always do it after. Um, and I, I was, you know, I was, you know, laboring over shadows because at first it was something like, you know, to get to the light, they need to go through shadows. And my wife was like, but well, that almost sounds like a religious movie or, you know, or maybe they're dead and they have to get to the light. So yeah, I, um, I, I try to keep it simple, try to intrigue people, but it's, I always labor over that a lot. Um, you know, and I'm glad you like that because that, that was tough because Shadows was hard for me to come up with like the trailer and the tagline and what to come up with. So, but yeah, I usually come up with that later. And, um, you know, I do, I, I adhere to this as well. You'll make the movie three times. There's the movie you write, there's the movie you shoot, and there's the movie you edit. So the Shadows was the epitome of that. And um, so at the end of it, I was able to say, oh, well, you know, and I was like coming up with taglines. I'm like, okay. And then I came up with, I don't know if this is on the, database or not but on the poster it's basically a midlife coming of age story yeah so i don't have hollywood's fascination with youth most of my screenplays center around a middle age usually woman um you know nowadays you know you got to be 18 or you're you know you're might as well retire but i don't i don't adhere to that i guess that's why i don't make movies in hollywood <laughs> but um no i i just i said you know this is kind of a midlife coming of age story so you're giving a voice to the people that that are, are probably trying to to get their voice out there. So I, I really yeah. appreciate that. Um, so we've talked about the past, Mike. We've talked mm-hmm. about the the kind of present of what's happening. What what's coming up for you in the future? Well, it's funny. I just wrote. It's so funny. I haven't written a scary film in about over 10 years. That's surprising and, because you talk about Friday the 13th so yeah, much. <laughs> my biggest influences are scary people um, with the exception of Lynn Shelton. Um, the last conversation I had with Lynn before she died and she died very tragically and suddenly she was only 54. I was asking her what her favorite scary movies were. And she goes, oh, I don't watch them. Like she goes, I've seen the shining. And she goes, recently I watched get out and that's it. And then we were laughing. Together. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's funny though. I'm glad you said that because I remember, and I'm not saying I'm ahead of my time or anything, I'm not, but I remember being a little kid, you know, or a pubescent, you know, teenager or whatever, and I'm watching these scary movies, and I thought, you know, these movies aren't taken seriously, but if you took these actors and put them in a quote-unquote, for lack of a better term, real movie, you know, they would do really well, I thought. And every now and then, someone will cross over. Jamie Lee Curtis became a big star. Kevin Bacon, who's in the original Friday the 13th. Of course, Johnny Depp's in Elm Street. But I always thought, these people, if you if you just put them in something maybe that more people would see or more people would take seriously, they, they, they could do it. So I've always thought that about horror and I've always been influenced. The, the reason Hitchcock's a master, the reason Hitchcock to me is the father of cinema is you don't need to make a thriller to feel his influence. You can make any film you want and be influenced by Hitchcock. My biggest influence from Alfred Hitchcock is how he could use confined spaces. He literally would back himself into a corner um, Space-wise, um, Dial in for Murder, with very few exceptions, takes place in her flat in London. Rear Window, of course, is all in one apartment. Rope is all in one apartment. I mean, back then, that was way more difficult than it is to do now. Those cameras were huge, and it was all film, not digital. Um, so my new movie, Shadows, with very few exceptions, takes place in one summer camp. Um, and I really respected that about that. And Lynn Shelton's Your Sister's Sister was basically one cabin. So I like that. Um, 
so anyway, to answer your question, I'm sorry, I was rambling. I um no, I wrote yeah. I got I got inspired to write a slasher film, which I'd never done. I'd written some scary movies here and there. Uh first screenplay I ever wrote was a sequel to John Carpenter's Christine. But I wrote this slasher film again, it takes place on one college campus, only in two buildings, and it takes place all during one day. So um I just I like to do that. I like to um almost limit myself and mainly because I'm so used to working with no money, literally no money. Like Shadows was about $30 a day for 17 days. And that just went to food and drinks for the crew. Mm -hmm. And then I had to come up with a little bit of money for post-production, but it was very little. So it's literally a zero budget film. And Lynn Shelton told me, and so did Don Coscarelli, who did Phantasm. He shot the original Phantasm, um, one of my favorite scary movies on weekends with no name actors. He said, Mike, no one knew who Angus Scrim was when I made Phantasm. He said, shoot it on weekends. And both Lynn Shelton and Don said, and I'm telling people this, if you can hear me, make sure you have good actors in front of that camera. Because if you're making a drama and you can't rely on boobs, some girl to take her shirt off, and you can't rely on a head exploding special effects, you have to rely on story, then make sure you got a good actor in front of that camera who can carry your film. And I really did. I'm very happy with Kendra and Trish and Rick in my film Shadows. So I just wrote this slasher film called Glare. And then I wrote another movie right after that called South Pass, which is about two friends who walk around South Pasadena. Again, takes place during one day. All one day, they go to the farmer's market in South Pasadena. They're both at a crossroads in their life and they just talk it out. So I wrote that. I wrote Glare in South Pasadena and I'm just trying to gain some momentum on either one and maybe, um, you know, shoot one of them, hopefully in the next you know year or so, not if the pandemic is winding down. Right. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that. That sounds really intriguing. There's something nostalgic about limiting your location and uh, the timing. It's almost theatrical in a way where you're looking at one space, you're letting the characters, the actors sort of play in that space in whichever way that you direct them to in whichever way they choose. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I've done plenty of film races where the good idea is to limit to maybe one actor, one location so that you can get it done quick and really hone in on the performance and the story that the character is putting forward. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think, what, what do you think is it about for you personally, that fascination with limiting yourself to those uh, particular factors? I, like I said, I love the fact that Hitchcock would do it. Have you seen Roman Polanski's Carnage? Highly recommend Carnage. Um, Carnage. Putting it on the list. Yeah. Carnage, yeah. I'm going to say it's maybe 2010. Um, Kate Winslet's in it. John C. Riley. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, Jody, okay. Yeah, Joni Foster. And uh, God, his name escapes me, but he won an Oscar with Tarantino for um, Inglorious Bastards. But um, uh, it's four people, and they never live. They never leave their, their apartment. This New York, it all takes place in one New York City apartment. And um, to be honest with you, though, the reason I'm attracted to it is strictly budgetary reasons. I mean, if you're at one location, it's only one thing to, to, to secure. Filmmaking, I always tell people if they've never done it, is phone calls and it's logistics. And it's trying to nail down everyone's schedule, which is, again, the, one of the most annoying things about it. It's like once you're on the set, it's like, oh, this is great. You know, it's like, oh, peace and quiet. It's nice and calm. It's before that pre-production can be a nightmare, you know, getting locations, getting everybody's schedule. If you have one or maybe two locations, it's just so much easier. You basically set up camp there and you can leave it up. You can leave the whole camp up during the duration of the film. So I do it for budgetary reasons, logistic reasons. And then some of my biggest influences like Roman Polanski's Carnage, of course, Hitchcock. Um, you know, I just, I'm fascinated that if, if someone can tell a story that's really gripping, but never really leave a location or rarely leave it. I think that's really, that says something. So it almost it. presents a challenge for you in, in the story to really make, make the, the story move forward and continue moving sure. forward and keeping the audience's attention and having that momentum when you're just limited, literally either budgetarily or mm -hmm. story-wise to that one location. That's great. That's yeah. amazing. Uh, Mike, I want to thank you so much for your time. I have a couple more questions for you. This first one's sure. a doozy, but I feel like I maybe have an idea of your answer. What is okay. your desert island movie? So if you could only watch one movie for the rest of your life, what would it be? That'd be tough, but it would have to be John Carpenter's Halloween. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, again, you know, again, um, I, I, I was watching a documentary once with Irwin Yablons who produced it. And he said, well, yeah, I came up with this low budget idea. I thought we could do it all in one night. 
So again, all in one night, Halloween's all in one night. And um, so, yeah, that's um, to be John Carpenter's Halloween. That's a very tough question, but at the end of the day, that's what it would be. Awesome. <laughs> that's great. Um, and finally, where can my filmmakers go to find out more about you, watch your films? Um, the Bone Garden should be on Amazon Prime very soon. Uh, the distributor, Camp Motion Pictures, is working out a deal with, um, it's also on, um, you can get it on Amazon, you know, the DVD. It's also on eBay, hard copy. I'm old, so I like um, physical media, you know, hard copy. That's what I'm stuff. all about, yeah. Um, yeah, oh yeah. But it should be able to stream on Hulu and Amazon Prime. I don't know when this will, people will see this, but hopefully sooner than later, maybe by the end of July. Um, Internet Movie Database, The Bone Garden, and my new movie, Shadows, have Facebook pages. You can find us on Facebook. The Bone Garden and Shadows both have a Facebook page. So that's where you can find out more about me. Perfect. And I'll link all of that in the show notes description. So please, filmmakers, be sure to check out all the links. Support independent filmmakers because that is the way that we're going to grow together and go forward, help each other out. Um, Lastly, Mike, do you have any parting thoughts, anything you'd like to say that you feel like you haven't been able to? Sure. Yeah. I'm glad you just mentioned support indie film. You know, there's been a huge change where now it's like either your movie's $800 $800 million Transformers sequel, or it's a $5 movie you'll put on YouTube. There's no <laughs> almost middle class in films anymore. Like I mentioned, David Mamet's State in Maine. That came out in 2000. Mm-hmm. They don't really make films like that anymore. There's real low budget, uh, even though there's a great cast in State in Maine, you know, William H. Macy among them, uh, the great, the late great C- Philip Seymour Hoffman. A lot, of, a lot of those low budget films just aren't coming out anymore it's either really huge you know or it's not you know maybe hopefully they're making a comeback i think lynn shelton my favorite filmmaker was pioneering a an indie movement out in seattle um so maybe they're making a comeback but they started to die out for a while so you know keep keep independent cinema alive keep that voice alive hey man it's easy to make a film for 20 million dollars i could make 50 films for $20 million. Are you kidding? Try making one for, you know, 20 grand and then get back to me. You know what I mean? Or less than that. So um, keep, keep, look, if you got an actor and you got a camera, get out there and in your backyard and shoot your movie and, you know, and steal shots. You don't even need a permit. Go out there. Just, you know, don't hurt anybody. Get your shot, get whatever you need to get and and make your film. You can edit it, you know, on your laptop. And you you couldn't do that when I was in film school. So a lot's changed for the better. It's more accessible and, um, and keep indie cinema alive. It's very important. That's for sure. Well, Mike, thank you so much for your time. It has been extremely inspirational for me mm-hmm. and, and motivational, this chat. Um, I would love for you to come back on the show whenever your next project inevitably picks up steam, gets released. I'd love to get you back on to chat some more because you've got so many secrets to share. I can just tell uh, you've been an amazing guest. Thank you so much for being on Filmmaker Secrets. My pleasure. I'm honored. It was an honor to talk to you. I appreciate you having me on. If you like that, then you are going to love my Cine Racing Challenge. This is a seven-day filmmaking competition where your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to write, shoot, and edit a short 60-second film in just seven days for your one chance to win with over $10,000 in prizes. So head over to CineRacing.com. That's C-I-N-E-R-A-C-I-N-G.com to get registered spots are filling up fast and the timer is ticking before the next Cine Racing Challenge launches so be sure to head over to CineRacing.com right now to get registered. I'll see you over there.